In this video, we take a look at the nature of liquids, their properties, how they change between different states, and vapor pressure. So liquids can still flow like gases, but they are held together. They can move past one another, but they are still held in contact with one another, unlike gases where they're spread apart. And the big difference is, again, that fact that they're in contact with each other because those gases have a stronger attraction for between them and gases are so little we ignore the attraction forces because of how fast they're moving those attraction forces are not able to keep them together but in a liquid they have such strong attraction forces between them they're held together but not so much that they're still stuck in place like you would see in a solid but enough that they will stay and give themselves a fixed volume so because of the, again, those attractive forces between them, they have that fixed volume because they're gonna stay pretty compact. You can't really squish down a liquid any more than the volume it's in, even when you put it under pressure. And it's that relationship between those motions, how quickly they're moving, how violently they're moving, and how attractive the particles are to each other, they'll determine what kind of physical properties they have and the fact of that they are liquid at room temperature. So we see gases like nitrogen and oxygen and the noble gases, since they're not polar, the only thing going on between them is those dispersion forces. So there's not a strong enough attraction to hold them together, as opposed to like water, that's a very polar molecule, and it even has that hydrogen bonding going on, keeping them together, making them a liquid. So evaporation is a vaporization process. Vaporization is in general when a liquid goes to a gas. There's two ways that this happens. And again, evaporation is the first one. It's when the particles on the surface absorb enough energy that they are able to jump off and escape and turn into gases because of how violently they're moving, but it doesn't get to a boil. And during evaporation, again, only those ones that have the greatest amount of kinetic energy, enough kinetic energy to escape and jump off from the liquid will turn to a gas. Unlike in boiling, that's going to happen all throughout. Evaporation is only on the surface. So evaporation happens more quickly at higher temperatures because now you have a greater amount of energy and there's less amount of energy needed to be absorbed to be able to get those particles that are really close to being gases to then be able to jump off. They need less energy to do so because they have a greater amount of energy to begin. So evaporation, though, is a cooling process. is kind of opposite as that thing. So you're putting energy into it at, to allow it to evaporate, but it's those ones, that, again, that are on the surface that are going to absorb that energy and are going to jump off. The ones up the surface have the greater amount of kinetic energy because they're moving faster, therefore occupying more space but they have the same mass, so more space, same mass, gives them a lower density, hence why they're up at the top. So you remove those ones of greater kinetic energy, then that will lower the overall average, therefore lowering the temperature, because temperature is the measure of the average kinetic energy. So we see that here, this puddle, if you kind of look at those different numbers as different molecules of water moving around as amount of kinetic energy they have, and those ones at the bottom have the least amount of kinetic energy. They're the most dense because they're moving the slowest. The ones up top, at the 30, are moving the fastest, so they are, have less density. And that's why they're at the top of that puddle. And right now, that average is 22 and a half. But then when I put it in front of the sun, and now that top layer evaporates off, now those 30s are all gone, and now I only have 15s and 20s and 25s, and then my average drops down to 20. And again, since they, my average kinetic energy lowered, I now have a lower temperature. So evaporation is a cooling process, even though you would think it's sitting out in the sun, it's going to warm up. Well, it's not warming up because the particles that had a greater amount of energy have now left. So vapor pressure is the gas particles of a particular liquid that are pushing down on top of that liquid. So looking at a puddle of water, the water vapor pressure is only the water vapor in the air pushing down on top of that puddle not the oxygen, the carbon dioxide, the nitrogen that are also there. We're looking at the same molecules of the same substance as it pushes down on that liquid. So in a system that is an equilibrium, you have a constant vapor pressure because that equilibrium, even though it's dynamic, it is changing. We have particles evaporating, particles condensating. They're just doing it at the same rate. So you end up getting the equal amount of vapor pressure since the amount of particles are remaining constant even though they are continuously changing the overall balance of them remains constant so you have a constant vapor pressure so the vapor pressure is going to change as the temperature changes 
as we increase temperature and more particles are going to evaporate off and become vapor, that I have more vapor particles pushing down. Conversely, if I have a lower temperature, then I'm going to have a greater amount of condensation happening and less amount of vapor particles if we're a lower vapor pressure. So that increased kinetic energy when we increase the temperature, again, it's going to increase the number of particles that therefore have the amount of kinetic energy needed to jump off and become gases. Again, giving us more particles colliding, more force over the same amount of area, therefore more pressure. So we see that here, these three different water bottles. The one on the left is an equilibrium as it's sitting in the room, and the condensation and evaporation, those errors we see there, are happening at a constant rate. The overall amount of water particles that are as a liquid to the, as to those that are vapor remains constant. Then the one in the middle, where it's again in the sun, and now it's absorbing more energy, it's heating up, then the evaporation is going to happen faster. We're going to get more water vapor particles, therefore pushing down the liquid, resulting in a greater amount of vapor pressure. Even though there is still going to be some condensation happening, the evaporation is going to be happening faster, therefore giving us more vapor particles. Then conversely, on the right side, again, we see them in ice, and the condensation now is going to be happening faster. Again, evaporation doesn't stop. It's just going to be going a slower rate than the condensation giving us now more water particles, less water vapor particles, and resulting in a lower vapor pressure. So vapor pressure is measured with an instrument we call a manometer. A manometer is a basically a U-shaped tube that's filled up with mercury, and as you increase or decrease the pressure, it will rise and fall. So here we see these U-shaped tubes, and one end is usually open and compared against atmospheric pressure, and the other end is connected to whichever pressure you're trying to read. And as there is a greater amount of pressure, as we see in the middle figure there, 2.2, that it pushes down greater than the atmospheric pressure, causing it to rise. And you can take that difference in height and do a calculation and determine how much pressure there is. Conversely, if there's a low amount of pressure, it kind of creates like a vacuum. Now the atmospheric pressure is winning that battle, pushing down. And again, you can measure that height and figure out what the pressure is of the vapor you're trying to figure out. So liquids also can vaporize through boiling. At evaporation, again, it's just the particles on the surface of that liquid that are absorbing energy from an external source, giving them great amounts of kinetic energy to then be able to jump off and become a vapor. But in boiling, now you have much more energy throughout that sample of a liquid, and therefore you have much more particles that are really close to, if not already, now going to be turning into gases because they might have kinetic energy that they have. So you have particles all throughout that liquid that are going to be turning into a vapor. That's why when boiling occurs, you see all those little bubbles as they begin to form and then come on through because those liquid particles all throughout are turning into a gas, making those bubbles. This point happens when the atmospheric pressure equals the vapor pressure for that particular liquid. So when water at sea level reaches 100 degrees Celsius, now the vapor pressure of that water is equal to the atmospheric pressure at sea level, that one atmosphere pressure or that 101.3 kPa. So here we see three different pots of water. The one on the left, only 70 kPa, not very much pressure going on inside that pot, where the atmospheric pressure again is 101.3 kPa. In the middle, then we start to heat up some, we have a little bit of evaporation happening, but yet still the pressure inside the pot is now only up to 95 kPa for the water vapor. And on the right, where, where it begins to boil, now we see that the pressure inside that pot is 101.3 kPa, and now it does equal the atmospheric pressure, so that water has now begun to boil. We have particles all throughout turning into a gas. So the boiling point will change based upon the external pressure. As we go to a higher altitude or as the barometric pressure changes, then the boiling point is going to change. Again, they need to be equal in order for a liquid to boil. So if the atmospheric pressure is going to change, then therefore the temperature at which it needs to it will boil will change. It, boiling, just like evaporation, is a cooling process again, because you are going to lose the ones of higher kinetic energy first, but now since you have a great amount of kinetic energy, you don't really have a large amount of change in the temperature. The normal boiling point for any given liquid is what its boiling point is at one atmosphere pressure, that's standard pressure as we already discussed. So again, water 
at one atmosphere pressure or 101.3 kPa or at 760 millimeters of mercury has a boiling point of 100 degrees Celsius. So here we see how the elevation relates to atmospheric pressure. As you go to higher elevations and there's less gas above you, then the atmospheric pressure is going to decrease. Again, they're going to have those minor variations between the atmospheric pressure even at sea level based upon the pressure systems of the weather, but you have drastic changes as you get to higher and higher and higher elevations just because of how much little gas there is above you. And that therefore effect is going to affect the boiling point. If the atmospheric pressure lowers, then I need a lower amount of kinetic energy because I need a lower amount of vapor pressure to then equal the atmospheric pressure and the boiling point is going to be lower. So this will affect things like boiling an egg. If I'm going to try and boil an egg at in Denver, where the boiling point now is going to be much lower, where it's going to be you know, significantly lower, 10 degrees lower Celsius, so therefore it's going to take a lot longer to cook that egg because I'm cooking it with less kinetic energy.